Hey, Steve. Hey, guys. How you doing? Hey, hey Shep. Yep. All right, I think we will go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to Voices for Housing. I appreciate everyone being here today. I'd like to begin by thanking my colleagues from Minnesota Coalition for the Homeless, Zach Eichten and Matt Trainer, as well as Shep Harris. I'd also like to thank Simpson volunteers, supporters and staff for making time to be here today. Voices for Housing is being recorded so it can be shared with others. We welcome questions throughout the hour. Please use the chat window to pose questions to either the full group or to one of the speakers. If you didn't register for today's workshop through Volunteer Hub, please send me a private chat with your email address and I'll send out an email later this afternoon with links to resources, a copy of the slides and a link to action that you can take. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry. Thanks, Matt. There we go. Beautiful. My name is Christina Giese, and I'm the Director of Volunteer Engagement for Simpson Housing Services. Again, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for being here today. I know it's very hard to bring attention and focus to an event like this while we witness the Chauvin trial and grieve the devastating killing of Dante Wright. Many of you know that George Floyd was a member of the Twin Cities shelter community as he was a shelter staff member at Salvation Army. Some of the shelter guests staying at Simpson were reflecting on his life earlier this week and remembering him with love. I hope that our gathering today um, and using our collective power and voice to influence public policy will feel helpful to all of us. Access to shelter and housing is a racial justice issue as well as a human rights issue. My colleagues are going to begin introducing themselves next, but while they are doing so, I'd like to ask you to share a little bit about yourself in the chat. Please share your name and what brought you here today. And in the meantime, Matt, Zach, and Shep will introduce themselves. Hello, I'll go first. Uh, Matt Trainer, uh, I am the Director of Organizing at the Minnesota Coalition for the Homeless. Uh, I think Matt is losing connection here a little bit, so I will go uh, while he is while he is figuring that out. Hi, folks. My name is Zach Eichten, and I am the director of public policy with the Minnesota Coalition for the Homeless. Um, I just started here uh, late November um, here at MCH, and this is my first legislative session in this role. Um, I'm super excited to be here to talk to you about what we're working on, um, and and hope that you join us in our advocacy efforts. I'll give it back to Matt now. Uh, do we want Shep to introduce himself right now too? Yeah, Matt, we didn't hear you at all though. So you might. Oh, my, my internet was hopefully it's good now. Um, yeah. Okay. So I'm Matt Trainer, Director of Organizing at the Minnesota Coalition for the Homeless. I did say that we really value our partnership with Simpson Housing. Uh, we have had a strong partnership for a long time. Um, and I am also a engagement team co-chair for the Homes for All Coalition. And now, uh, Shep. Uh, thanks, Matt. Appreciate it. Uh, Shep Harris uh, with the uh, law firm of Fredrickson and Byron. Uh, my preferred pronouns are he, him, his. Um, I am not an attorney. I am a, a lobbyist, uh, a proud lobbyist for Simpson Housing and uh, working in tandem in coalition with Matt and Zach and Christina and, and many others. So thank you for, uh, for my uh, glad to be here on such an important topic. Thank you, Shep. And thanks to those of you who participated in the chat question. Right now I'm going to launch a poll to learn a little bit more about your experience with advocacy. It is multiple choice, so feel free to answer all of the options that apply to you. So fun seeing results coming in on my end. I'll share these full results in a little bit. Oh, 
Okay, I'm going to share those results. Looks like we have a lot of experience in the room today. I'm so pleased. Thank you all for being here. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to give an overview of the Minnesota Coalition for the Homeless. So we are a nonprofit or statewide uh, advocacy organization that we work towards, you know, making sure everybody can have their own home. Uh, we're, we've been focusing recently on trying to end unsheltered homelessness, which you can see reflected in our agenda that Zach will go into later. But just a really quick snapshot, uh, the Minnesota Coalition has been around since 1984. Uh, and there's a group of service providers and organizations such as Simpson uh, that really we're starting to think along the lines of like, you know, the work we're doing, these direct services are super important, but we'd like to look upstream a bit and try to make sure homelessness, you know, has enough resources to one day not exist. So they said, let's form a coalition. And it became an organization and the Coalition for the Homeless has been around um, ever since. So uh, we really rely a lot on our members to make sure our legislative agenda aligns with what the statewide need is. And we also, uh, you know, our main task is making sure we're at the Capitol passing legislation, but also making sure our members feel connected and we do a conference every year uh, to make sure there's best practices being shared as well. So that's just a quick snapshot about the Coalition for the Homeless. Thank you, Matt. I can tell in the chat a lot of you are very familiar with Simpson Housing. We started in the early 80s as well with a shelter located within Simpson United Methodist Church in South Minneapolis. Since then, our programming has grown to meet community needs. We now serve about 250 individuals in supportive housing each year, as well as about 300 families with 600 children. In addition to our shelter and housing programs, Simpson also operates the Adult Shelter Connect office on behalf of the Single Adult Shelter Collaborative in Hennepin County. So single adults who are in Hennepin County seeking shelter interact with the staff at Adult Shelter Connect. And last year they served 6,580 adults. So we're really pleased to share our vision for the Simpson Community Shelter and Apartments. You can see a drawing there on the screen. Um, this low barrier space will include 70 new shelter beds as well as 42 new units of permanent supportive housing. We're designing a model that we hope can be replicated across the Twin Cities, the state and the nation. One of the reasons that we're here today is to talk about advocacy related to this project. And for that, I'd like to invite Shep. Great, thanks, Christine. I appreciate it. Um, well, actually, what I, I might do is uh, just for a moment. I'm going a little off script here, I, just to, to defer to Steve. Uh, and Steve, Steve has done a great job, actually. Of, uh, and I'm not just saying that because he's a client. I'm a client of his, or he's a client of mine. But he's done a really good job of testifying up at the Capitol, especially with the um, challenges we've had with COVID, doing it distance related. Um, and also participating in the various uh, meetings that we've had with legislators, educating them about the need. But so, Steve, I don't know, if, did you want to say anything else in terms of the, the shelter project and um, the work that we've done up at the Capitol? Huh, look at that. Now I'm allowed to unmute myself. <clears throat> I couldn't even I couldn't even come off mute to say hello earlier. Um, thank you so much, Shep. Uh, I don't know. Um, I think that it, it's interesting to me just reading um, everyone's thoughts about why they wanted to be here, about raising voices up and about making housing a priority and about um, making sure that we are talking about housing as not only um, a uh, economic quality of life issue, but also as an issue relate, directly related to, uh, to um, uh, racial equity in our community. And, um, and I just want to, uh, I guess really thank um, thank Shep as well as our, our coalition partners um, who helped me um, to kind of shape my testimony um, to include all of that. Um, and so I want that's what I wanted to say is that um, is that uh, when when I get the opportunity to get in front of folks and talk about our project, it's about the quality of work 
um, that our staff does. It's about the, the vital nature of, of housing in our community, and it's about um, uh, positioning positioning this appropriately so people are, are, are considering the fact that this is um, directly related to racial equity. It's directly related to, to healthcare outcomes in our community um, and, uh, and those sorts of things. So, um, so yeah, we couldn't, uh, we, we could not have a better set of partners. So thanks guys. Thank you, Stephen. And thank you, Christine, for, for letting me go off script there for a moment. But um, yeah, we've been working very hard up at the Capitol. And when I say we, it's not just Steve and myself. Um, the partnership with the Minnesota Coalition for, for Homelessness is very important um, and has been vital. We've also had, uh, we, we added to our team at Fredrickson and Byron this year, you might uh, be familiar with the name Jeff Hayden, uh, a former state senator uh, who is very familiar with this area. In fact, he carried the legislation for Simpson uh, last year. And so um, we're, we're proud to have him on our lobbying team. And so, yes, I'm, I'm clapping for him too. And uh, so he and I have been working together up at the Capitol on this. And just to, the quick background is that we had uh, a bill introduced that is similar to the larger coalition effort, um, but, but specific to Simpson that would um, dedicate or allocate $10 million in shelter infrastructure bonds uh, for Simpson housing. Uh, and through the Department of Human Services, we had on the House side, Representative Hoden Hassan uh, be the chief author of the bill. And on the Senate side, we had uh, Senator Omar Fateh in introduce the bill as well. Um, we were fortunate to have hearings on both bills in the House and in the Senate in um, the housing committees, the appropriate housing committees. We also had a hearing on the bill in the House Capital Investment Committee. And so as a result, um, the bill is, uh, we've had in, in tandem with the larger effort, uh, as you'll hear more about here in a few minutes, um, we have language in the proposed House Omnibus Capital Investment Bill, the, the bonding bill in the House uh, for $10 million uh, that would go towards Simpson for this new project that you see in front of you. Um, and uh, the, the wrinkle in it, uh, which is not a bad thing necessarily, uh, is that it's, it's a, a different form of payment rather than shelter infrastructure bonds. It's called housing infrastructure bonds. And uh, the, the approach that we're taking up at the Capitol, in case you get asked for those of you, thank you for all the work that you've already done because uh, we have done an action alert and it's been very helpful. Uh, but uh, if you get further questions, um, for us, it's, it's not necessarily um, how the dollars are paid for to, uh, for the project, but um, the fact that we need the funding. So whether it's um, housing infrastructure bonds, shelter infrastructure bonds, or even other types of bonding, uh, we'll take it. Um, or if it's just plain cash. So um, on the Senate side, the bill is sitting in Senator Bach's Capital Investment Committee. It has not received a hearing. Not many bills on the Senate side have. That is part of the fun negotiating game of chess that happens up at the legislature, especially this time of session. So what I just want to leave you with is that we're in a good position uh, for success this session, but it can only be guaranteed, frankly, and this is not to, to give you any guilt for those who are watching this live or perhaps uh, watch it later uh, at a later time, but we need your help. Uh, you've already helped. We need the help to keep going. Uh, because there are thousands of, of different issues up at the Capitol that legislators hear about on a daily basis. There's only so much they can absorb on a daily basis. And frankly, it comes down to the old adage that the squeaky wheel gets the grease. And when we can show clearly that there is a need uh, for our brothers and sisters who are out on the streets, uh, especially uh, that it, it, it is afflicting uh, the majority of the people that are served are uh, from people of color for, or from indigenous communities, the need is clear, it is obvious, but we need the advocacy, we need you to help us up at the Capitol. So thank you very much. Thank you, Shep, for being here. I can only imagine how incredibly busy you are at this time. And I always learn when you speak. So thank you for joining us. All right, you can see on your screen that we have an overview of the rest of our time together. Um, now that we've had a chance to introduce ourselves and our organizations, I thought we could look ahead a bit. You'll see that we will learn about some recent advocacy successes, share tips. There will be a short breakout session as well, so we can do a little bit of practice. There's also going to be time to take your questions. 
All right, one of my favorite things to do is learn our reach. So I'm gonna pop a link into the chat so that you can find which legis legislative district you live in. If you already know your legislative district, you can put that in the chat now as well. Otherwise you can visit that link, put in your address and then, and then add your legislative district. If you don't know your district, it's a great day to find out. One of us can help you too. Christina, should, do you want me to go over uh, some of the advocacy works while people are doing that? I think that's great, great idea. Yeah, okay. So before um, Zach dives into the legislative agenda and policy stuff, uh, I just wanted to highlight, sometimes it can be frustrating, you know, when we talk about advocacy, sometimes it takes a while to see the impact of, you know, the individual emails or phone calls we make, you know, but it all adds up as Shep was saying, but this is just proof that it does work. Uh, so. Uh, these numbers are since 2012, which is the first year uh, H4A is Homes for All. So since 2012, um, and prior to this, you know, there wasn't even housing infrastructure bonding going on. So this is something really new. I mean, almost a decade old now, <laughs> time flies. But uh, since 2012, we're looking at almost $560 million dollars that we've been able to secure thanks to all of our advocacy. Uh, that's including bonding, which is really to develop and rehab um, affordable housing or public housing. And then also items within the budget, the state's budget that's for um, housing and services, you know, to think about keeping the lights on at different shelters or other nonprofits to make sure there's quality staff. Uh, to make sure there's rental assistance, homeless prevention dollars, things like that. So, you know, that's a significant amount of money. Uh, and then also, uh, uh, some of you may already know this, um, but in 2019, we got a hundred dollar a month increase for the Minnesota Family Investment Program. And that is a huge victory. It took forever to get there, but we got there. Um, and then also to date uh, for COVID specific, you know, we had a hundred million in the state in state funding to pay for some uh, rental and mortgage assistance. We've gotten more money, but that's been federal money. So uh, this is just number specific to the state. And then also we had about twenty six and a half million dollars that uh, was primarily for shelters to. Uh, ensure residents of shelters, um, street outreach, that people could stay safe from COVID. So that could look through personal protective equipment. It could look like uh, hotel stays. It could look like, you know, making sure that shelters had the appropriate um, uh, ratio of how many people could be in a space and still adhere to the six foot rule. Um, so we've we've had great success. Obviously, we're not done, but this should make people feel a little bit energized in regards to if we stick with it, we can win. So now, uh, well, Christina, did you want to go over anything of uh, some of the chat responses or no? No? Okay. I think you might be more familiar than me. Okay. Okay. So I'll, I'll just I'll just hand it off to Zach now for our legislative agenda. Great. Thanks, Matt. So uh, I just want to go over the uh, Minnesota Coalition for the Homeless Legislative Agenda, and primarily uh, it all falls into shelter saves lives, housing ends homelessness. Um, that's that's really what we're going for uh, throughout all, all that we're doing at the Capitol this year is we know that we need emergency shelter, and we also need to make sure that we are supporting permanent, uh, safe, and affordable housing as well. Um, so to that end, uh, this is our, our one pager uh, that Kirsten was able to make for us uh, before, she, before she took a new job. So this is her legacy here. Um, great, great front page. Uh, this is the three things that primarily we're working on. And then on the back side is, is our, uh, 
the more details on, on what we're working on. It also includes a Homes for All agenda. Um, we, we know that we need the entire continuum of housing. When we all do better, we all do better. So um, we're really supportive there. And I'm gonna get into all these in a second here, but that's available on our website, um, which is uh, mnhomelesscoalition.org. So what we know is that we need more shelter spaces. Um, those of you here uh, from Simpson know that, uh, you know, there's, there's a great Simpson project, uh, but there are projects around the state that, that really need strong investment. And uh, based off of uh, the data that we had at the beginning of session, we were advocating for a $50 million investment into the shelter infrastructure system to expand capacity and preserve our existing capacity. Um, we were doing that through a variety of ways. We were advocating for, for shelter cash. We were advocating for uh, what Shep mentioned earlier, those shelter infrastructure bonds. Um, at one point, that uh, we were uh, also advocating a little bit for some general obligation bonding. Um, and now, uh, as Shep mentioned, uh, right now, that investment is being placed into housing infrastructure bonding. Um, throughout this entire time, we've been really clear um, find the money, people will use it. Um, and, that, and that's really what we're focusing on now is making sure that the type of money works, but really that that investment is continuing. So um, in, if you include all the federal streams, uh, there's actually about seven possible streams of funding this session. Um, and we have four, four streams in the, in the state level and three from federal. Uh, so there's a lot of possibility to get uh, some emergency shelter uh, capacity up and running. Um, and we're really excited about um, where we're at. So right now there's that $50, $50 million total investment uh, to the state, but 10 million of that is a carve out in the proposed budget for the Simpson project. Um, and then there's also uh, $2.5 million a year proposed in the health and human services budget for um, increasing the supply and maintaining the supply of shelter beds. So um, we're really excited about that as well. All said and done, it's about $60 million worth of investment into shelter capacity um, in, the, in the House budget, uh, the proposed budget. We're still waiting on a capital investments bill in the Senate. So uh, we'll get back to you when we, when we learn more about that. But that's our, that's our capacity. So now the operations part. Um, all of you who are working at Simpson know how incredibly important having good uh, operations of that shelter is. And right now, uh, the state of Minnesota, quite frankly, falls short of, of the goal of providing safe and accessible shelter for all. Um, currently, the base budget for the emergency services program, which is the funding pool that actually uh, provides not only operations, but all the extra good things like mental health care, uh, chemical substance uh, health care, um, child care, transportation, um, employment counts, like all those great things. And the base budget of that per year is $844,000, which is just chronically underfunded and, and quite frankly, ridiculously underfunded um, for, for where we know the need is. Um, so we were advocating for increasing that by another $15 million over the biennium. So seven and a half million dollars a year, um, actually in the, in the house budget this year, um, that's proposed in the health and human services, they actually went above and beyond this. Um, so instead of 16.7 million over the biennium, like we proposed, they went all the way up to 18, um, which is a, a fantastic investment um, and really shows uh, that our advocacy is making a difference because uh, even back in 2019, when there was a uh, when there was a surplus, the proposed increase was a three million dollar one time um, increase, um, and, and they ended up getting that. But this right here, an 18 million dollar base budget increase, um, would be hugely impactful for getting. Um, folks who lack housing stability or are unhoused currently um, into uh, housing uh, much quicker. So that's getting, that's the shelter side. So what are we doing then for housing? So, you know, shelter saves lives, housing ends homelessness. So we are supportive of the housing support program. All of the data from uh, DHS points to housing support being the program that makes sure that the most people stay in stable housing. Um, once they leave homelessness. And what it does is it in, in has a bunch of different uh, 
types of housing all lumped into one program. They used to be disparate, uh, used to be known as group residential housing. Not everybody is group residential. Um, some people are in individual settings, which is what we're really focused on is those community settings. Um, and what we're advocating for is an increase to the base rate payment. So essentially what that can do is right now base rate payment pays for room and board and utilities, um, and it's capped at $934 a month. Based off of where I see uh, folks uh, living, I, I would challenge you to find uh, rent plus utilities for less than $934 a month um, in your community. Um, it's just, it's just not realistic uh, for most folks. So we're advocating for that increase so that folks who are in stable housing um, are able to stay enrolled in this program and our providers are able to continue to provide this program so folks can stay in stable housing. Additionally, and this is another uh, more of a policy piece that I'm really excited about, um, is a waiver for the absence requirement in this program. Currently, uh, no matter what, you can only be gone from your unit for 18 days at a time and a maximum of 60 days in a calendar year um, if you're in the housing supports program. We want to make a waiver that was in place for COVID permanent. Um, and what it would do is for folks seeking treatment, they would be able to seek that treatment um, without fear of losing their housing. Um, so if you needed to get mental health treatment or um, any other behavioral health treatments, you'd be able to go do that and not worry if you still have a place to come home to. So it, it encourages folks to get the needed treatment to stay in that stable housing. Um, and we're really excited. This actually, this proposal ended up in the Senate HHS bill. Um, and we're really excited that uh, the Senate caucus is taking a position of keeping folks who need this stable housing um, in that stable housing. So we're in a really great position um, for both the homelessness and housing side throughout uh, you know, the, both the House and Senate this year. Um, we're really excited to keep working, but um, as Shep mentioned, uh, this is sort of the home stretch and um, any amount of help that you can give in just mentioning it to uh, your lawmakers that these provisions are important actually does go a long way. Um, the squeaky wheel does get the grease. And if, if they keep hearing about something, the more likely they are to actually prioritize it when it gets to the, uh, the snipping and cutting phase. So uh, that's, that's why we're here today uh, to, to tell you about what we're working on. Um, so then that's, that's the MCH agenda. I wanna bring up the Homes for All agenda too. Um, we are very supportive of everything Homes for All is doing. They're doing a lot of great things, tenant protection stuff, um, housing investments, um, a source of income discrimination um, prohibition, a bunch of great things uh, that we, we all know that we need these investments in order for our entire, entire continuum to be supported. Um, so if you wanna learn more about what Homes for All specifically is working on, either pop a question in the chat or go to the homesforallmn.org webpage. Um, it has all of the information about what Homes for All is working on, but this year is a especially uh, great agenda. And I'm not just saying that because I'm one of the policy co-chairs. Um, it really is a comprehensive agenda that goes uh, and spans the entire continuum of housing. I'll toss it back to Matt. All right, thanks, Zach. Uh, and I'm gonna be quick here so we can make sure we have some time for the breakouts and stuff, but just general old overview of advocacy, um, why advocate you all, you're here, so you probably know this, but it really helps you to connect to something you care about, makes you be part of something bigger than yourself, you can really make a difference. Um, and then just, you know, a lot of people, you know, think about the fiscal costs and the fiscal impact, which is important, but people and stories can't be created in a spreadsheet, right? So we need people to do that advocacy. Um, how does it impact winning uh, long-term, right? We have to think about that, such as MFIP taking over 30 years. There's gonna be times when we have to think of the short-term and react right then and there, like fast and furious, which we did with COVID. And you just really need to think of both quantity and quality which I think our agenda and the Homes for All agenda and the new Simpson project is a perfect example of quantity and quality. So some opportunities, um, you know, in a virtual world, this year's odd to say the least when it comes to advocating. So these are more just general buckets of ways that you can advocate and not have to rely on a different organization to lead in the advocacy. You can just talk to your communities, get them engaged, 
um, develop relationships with your lawmakers, right? You can advocate outside of le legislative session, uh, you know, when they're home outside of session, offer to get coffee, offer to go for a walk, you know, offer them to come to your place of, you know, if you volunteer somewhere or work somewhere. Um, if you see an action alert, participate. I know sometimes it can be like, I don't feel like doing it. I'm just one person, but again, makes a big difference. Uh, if you're on social media, anytime you see Simpson or MCH or Homes for All post, uh, like their post and share it, get some energy going on social media. Uh, if you're attending events, I know some people are into, you know, caucusing with your local delegations and your whatever political party you're affiliated with. Make sure you attend those things and speak out, speak on homelessness, um, attend town halls or candidate forums and ask questions. Uh, how are they going to prioritize housing and homelessness? Uh, there's also, right, so you can get prepared. So I think, and later on, we're going to have everybody write their power introduction, but you can do that at any moment, right? Draft out your two to three minute story so you have it ready. And some ways you can use that story is with legislators. You can schedule your own at any time, right? Legislators work for you, not the other way around. Uh, you can do written testimony. Anybody can do that. Uh, verbal testimony, if it's at the legislature, I think it's most helpful if you reach out to Zach or a Shep or, you know, Christina, somebody that's really knowledgeable about the legislative process, because there are some nuances within that. Um, but you can also just send a personal email whenever you want. And we have a short video here um, that Zach created. It's This is kind of a premiere. So... Uh, this is to just make it comfortable for meeting with a legislator on your own. Hey there, shelter supporters. This is Zach Eich, the Director of Public Policy with the Minnesota Coalition for the Homeless, here with a training on how to meet with your lawmaker. So let's get right into it. Uh, the first thing that you're going to want to do whenever you're meeting with a lawmaker is to introduce yourself. And if you're in person, uh, once the pandemic is over, of course, uh, go ahead and shake their hand to, to develop that first introduction piece. Thank them for taking the time to meet with you. Hello, Representative Fitz. My name is Zach. Hey, Anyone man. else having the the sound cut out? Can you still hear it? Nope. No. Click share sound earlier. Otherwise, you can't mute yourself with it because it was going through your speakers. Did you hear any of it? Oh, you did. Yeah, until you muted, I think. Okay. Okay. I'll start over. There we go hold on to perhaps a one pager from the MCH legislative agenda. So what I wanted to give you first here is our one pager on the MCH legislative agenda. All of the information about our bills uh, is, is right there um, if you need to reference that at any time. Once you've handed it over, uh, now is the time to start your story. Uh, you're gonna to wanna to tell your story, how you practiced it using the tips and tricks from the how to tell your story page on the advocacy toolkit. Now I'd like to tell you my story. My name is Zach Eichten. I'm the director of public policy with the Minnesota Coalition for the Homeless and I'm a constituent of yours. From here, this is where you're gonna to wanna to take the opportunity to go through the tips and tricks in the advocacy toolkit for how to tell your story uh, so that's a really personalized uh, story for you. Now, when you're telling your story, what you're also gonna to wanna to do is make sure that you keep within a pretty consistent time frame. We recommend being between five and seven minutes long. We wanna make sure that there's time for questions and a conversation with your lawmaker after you've told your story uh, to make sure that you're able to build on the story that you're, you tell in these meetings. Thank you for taking the time to listen to my story, uh, Representative Fitz. Um, I, I've really appreciated the time I've gotten to, to speak with you. Do you have any questions um, for me? At this point, this is where the representative senator will follow up with questions from the story that you provided. Finally, you're going to want to make sure that you keep an eye on the clock. 
During these legislative meetings, you have around 15 minutes max if we're in the middle of legislative session to meet with your lawmakers. Staying on time can be really key to making a meeting go smoothly. Representative, I noticed that it is, uh, we've been meeting for about 14 minutes now, and I just want to take the opportunity to say thank you. Uh, I want to be respectful of your time. I know you have a very busy schedule. If you have any further questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Otherwise, um, I've left my contact information um, with your legislative assistant. Finally, at the end of every single one of your legislative meetings, you're going to want to say thank you, whether it's thank you for taking the time to meet with you, uh, thank you for uh, hearing my story, thank you for signing on to the bills um, that we talked about today, thank you for your support. Whatever it is, always make sure to say thank you for at least one thing so that the lawmaker leaves the meeting with a good idea uh, and good feeling from meeting with you. Uh, thank you once again for taking the time to meet with me. And I will uh, happily look forward to your support on the MCH legislative agenda. And then finally, after the meeting is over, what you're going to want to do is set up a time for yourself to write a thank you note or thank you email to the lawmaker. Um, it's really critical to get those follow up thank you emails in place. They appreciate it. Um, and it's also an opportunity for you to remind them what they agreed to in the meeting whether or not it's uh, any action items like signing onto a bill or thanking them for their support or thanking them for talking to some other members about whatever you wanna work on. It's always a good opportunity to say thank you. Uh, and that's how you meet with a legislator. I uh, hope this was really informative for all of you. Um, if you ever have any questions about this, feel free to uh, either send me an email or fill out that take action form on the take action page um, and we'll get in touch. Thanks folks. All right, so that was a pretty awesome overview of how to meet with a legislator. Um, and hopefully it helped you feel a little bit more comfortable if you are able to secure a meeting. So I, what we're gonna move into now is framing a powerful introduction. And this is going to be what you're going to do yourself. And then we're gonna get into breakout groups and you're gonna practice it with one another. So the reason that we focus so much on a powerful introduction is because it's literally the first thing legislators are going to hear from you. So you wanna make sure that you address them in a way that makes them know they should listen to you. So not only are you an amazing advocate, but you're an advocate that also has a community behind you. So like in this example, Hello, Senator. My name is Matt. I live in Duluth. I volunteer monthly with my faith community to make meals for people experiencing homelessness. We have a group of 75 dedicated volunteers that are committed to improving the lives of the approximately 20,000 Minnesotans that experience homelessness on any given night. I have been volunteering for over 10 years and welcome you to join us sometime. I encourage you to support. And then it goes into whatever bill you would be supporting. So, um, I am going to actually stop screen sharing right now. Uh, there we go. So now we can see it. So what we're going to do now is we'll give you a few minutes to write your own power introduction. Um, and again, it doesn't have to be perfect. You know, this is your draft. So go ahead and actually, um, when I say it doesn't have to be perfect, we're actually hoping that you will include your power introduction in an action alert that we're gonna do before the end of this. So while it is a draft, we do hope that you send it to your legislator. The one thing I would say is at the end of your power introduction, if you're here because of your connection with Simpson, um, the current action alert just has 50 million for shelter capital. But if you can put in your introduction saying, and I'm a member of Simpson Housing Services, appreciate the 10 million carve out for Simpson as well, just to make sure that they know you're, you know, advocating on behalf of Simpson's uh, bill as well. So we'll give you about two minutes right now. And I haven't been following the chat room, um, Christina. Have you, you put the links in and stuff? I did. I put the link in for the legislator visit template. Perfect. So in that, what she shared um, has additional info to write your full story too. But we're just focusing on the power introduction for this part.
So we got about a minute left. At about 30 seconds or so. All right, we're reaching the two minutes. So and when you get into breakouts to practice, feel free to fine tune it again afterwards. But Christina, if you're willing to put everybody in the, we'll go into groups of three, right? So.
All right. I think everybody's trickling back in from the groups. I think there might be one or two more groups we're waiting for. Just in the way of public information, um, if anyone's wondering why there's emergency sirens going off, it's a tornado drill. Oh, wow. Thank you, Steve. Oh, okay, we got everybody here. Cool. Okay, so what I'm going to screen share again. Oh, click share. Okay, so we just did that. Uh, and this is where we're hoping that uh, you can insert your power intro. So this is an action alert that we just launched yesterday morning. Yeah, yesterday morning. So um, it's thanking Chair Fu Li of the House Capital Investment Committee. Uh, that's the person that created the House Capital Investment, the bonding proposal. Uh, there's a lot of different players that went into it, including advocacy. Uh, but we just wanted to make sure we're thanking Chair Lee for including shelter capital. And part of the reason for that, too, is you know, as the session goes on, there's going to be a lot of tough negotiating, you know, a lot of great issues. As Chef was saying, they hear stuff all the time. But we want to make sure Chair Lee knows we're appreciative. They don't always get thank you action alerts. So when they do, I think they probably enjoy it a bit. Um, and it'll just help encourage them to stand strong when they're behind closed doors doing those final negotiations. So I know Christina's going to insert the link in the chat. But I'm going to also just screen share to show how simple it is to customize these emails. So uh, you'll just click on the link, right? And then this is what we call the landing page where it just gives an overview recap of what the action alerts about. So then you can scroll down. Um, and if you want for fast action, if you check mark this, then like my stuff was already populated it'll do that for you every time. So it's super fast. Then you just click here to continue. And we had to create a custom target. So right there, it says fully chair. But when it comes across into his inbox, it'll say, dear chair, chair Lee, dear chair fully. So then you can go right, this is the body of the email that will actually be sent. So what you can do is you just click there, hit enter a couple of times, and then you can type your power intro right there, right? I've already sent this, so I'm not going to do it again. Um, but that's how easy it is. And then you just hit send message. And there's even an easy start over button, just to make sure I don't send them another one on accident. So I'm going to stop screen sharing. And it looks like, yep, so Christina did uh, chat the link for the action alert. So if you all want to click that, send the email. One other thing I would say too is once you're done with that, which would be awesome to uh, pass it along to some other folks that you know too and encourage them to take action. So I think just a basic rule of thumb is if you can get three other people to do it, that's awesome. All right, and Christina pointed out, once you've done it, please state in the chat that you completed the action alert. Yeah, I see some of you already did it earlier this week too, so yeah. While we're doing this, we could do some Q&A too, if anybody has any questions. I mean, you got a wealth of knowledge in here between, you know, especially Shep, Steve, and Zach, if you have like policy questions or legislative questions.
Christina, would you like me to uh, screen share the contact info piece now or keep doing this for a bit? I think you can go forward. Okay. Yeah, so I can I can take this here um, just while folks are finishing filling it out um, on how to stay connected with us. So uh, there we do have an advocacy toolkit. Um, I think Christine was going to link that in the chat here too. Oh, she already did. Um, and uh, that's really great. It has a lot of really great information, um, links to our one pagers, how to schedule meetings with lawmakers, lawmaker contact info, um, some of our regional interview. Uh, our expert interviews um, so that you can learn what's going on around the state in the realm of uh, homelessness advocacy and um, actual operations. Um, really great uh, uh, advocacy toolkit. Uh, definitely tune in uh, and look at that. Um, you can become a shelter supporter if you want to be more involved in our shelter supporter campaign. Um, email Matt on the next uh, on the next slide. You'll get his uh, contact information. Um, we do have social media uh, right now um, at MN Homeless Co on Twitter and at Homes for All MN. Uh, we're also on Facebook. Um, to be honest, right now Kirsten uh, took a new job, so it is it is more intermittent uh, in our in our actual postings uh, than it used to be. So. Um, we will post important updates there, but um, it won't be as as frequent for a little while here. But most importantly, uh, I, I want to invite all of you to join us for the Homes for All rally on May 5th. It's 10 to 1130. It's all on Zoom um, and uh, all of the registration uh, links. Uh, I know Christina mentioned she was going to send out after uh, this event. Um, Please, please join us. Uh, we're going to have some really great speakers. We're going to have some lawmakers, some folks with lived experience, I think, uh, speaking as well. Um, and it's going to be a really great way to uh, kick off the end of session um, on May 5th. So I hope to see you there. And then finally, here's our contact information. So if you do have any uh, questions um, or want to know more about what's going on, either from the organizing side, policy side, let us know. Uh, Matt and I's email is right there as, uh, as well as our website. So uh, just thanks to all of you for joining us today. It was it was really great to see all of you. Thanks, everyone. I added a survey link in the chat if you have a couple minutes to let us know how we can improve Voices for Housing. Like Zach said, we appreciate your time today. I know it's an incredibly difficult week. And let us know if you have questions. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Oh, where is the exit? Hi, Anna, too. Hey, I was wondering where is my exit? So I'm glad I didn't exit. <laughs> you're stuck. <laughs> Thank you so much. This was so, so good. Oh, you're so sweet. Thank yeah, you. You were excellent. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Christina. Bye, yeah. Anna, too. <laughs> okay, lovely. Bye, guys. Bye, Bye everyone.